This is a report I know that the, the board has been uh, looking forward to, uh, and I know members of our community as well. So we'll go ahead and go to the next slide, Rich. Uh, the purpose of this evening's presentation is to provide an update concerning our return to learn plan, review district level results based on our NWEA map growth assessment as administered to kindergarten through eighth grade students in February and March. Our purpose is to also identify areas of strength and challenge in both reading and mathematics. Additionally, the later part of this presentation will outline our plans to address the academic and socio social emotional needs of our students as we conclude this school year, transition to summer, and the next year. Our in-person five days per week return to learn plan remains on track to begin tomorrow. Uh, IDPH is recommending the schools default to providing in-person learning and use the adaptive pause approach to determine when hybrid or remote learning needs to be implemented. Moving forward, schools will remain open for five days per week of in-person instruction as long as we're able to fully implement the five key mitigation strategies this approach is grounded in the science about how COVID-19 spreads and limited risk of transmission within our schools. As a reminder, the new guidance from the Illinois State Board of Education and the Illinois Department of Public Health recommends that schools default to in-person instruction and use the adaptive pause approach to determine when hybrid or remote learning needs to be moved. Um, Moving forward, our, keys, our schools will provide in-person instruction five days per week, uh, implementing the five key mitigation strategies, including universal and correct use of mask, physical distancing, hand washing and respiratory etiquette, cleaning and maintaining health facilities, and contact tracing in combination with isolation and quarantine and the transmission of the virus uh, within schools is minimal. We will continue to carefully monitor the level of community transmission, the transmission level within our schools, and our ability to implement the necessary mitigation strategies and when necessary, we'll engage in targeted closures, focusing on classrooms, grade levels, or individual schools. Additionally, we will continue to update the COVID-19 dashboard so that families can make informed decisions. After weeks of the level of community spread trending down, like the rest of the country, uh, county, state, and country, we are seeing some uptick in our health metrics. We continue to be confident in our ability to implement the mitigation strategies and to minimize the spread of the virus within our buildings. As an additional mitigation strategy, we'll continue to offer surveillance testing for students in grades six through 12, and all staff members will be increasing the frequency to two times per week. As we return from spring break, we have heard concerns about not taking a two week adaptive pause given the increased likelihood that families and the staff have traveled during this time. First, we wanna remind families that have traveled internationally they are required to quarantine following the trip unless they're fully vaccinated. Please contact your school health office for next steps. If you traveled domestically and were able, not able to follow the travel guidelines of wearing a mask, avoiding crowds, and maintaining six feet of physical distance from people not in your household, we are encouraging families to follow the CDC guidelines and get a RT-PCR test three to five days after you travel and quarantine from others for seven full days. If you're not able to uh, to get a COVID test. We're asking that families quarantine for a full 10 days following their return. Additionally, if you did not travel but are concerned about others, you may choose to quarantine as well. Any student that is quarantining their, this, during this time may participate in remote relearning. Following these protocols will be essential in minimizing the spread of the virus within our schools and community and ensuring we do have uh, to implement an adaptive pause. We are aware of a recent New York Times article about the Safeguard Surveillance Program the article omits several important points about the program, including how the program has been authorized to operate under guidance from the Federal Department of Health and Human Services and the fact that it has successfully identified hundreds of cases of COVID-19. It is important to remember that this testing is voluntary. It's an additional mitigation measure and we're not making a diagnosis, but rather referring any individuals with an identified sample for a PCR COVID test. As a reminder, IDPH has changed the definition of social distancing for students and fully vaccinated staff during school hours to three to six feet of physical distance when universal masking is in place. While this is great news and allows us to return to in-person learning five days per week for all students, I also wanna remind you that the definition of close contact and the need to quarantine for 14 days has not changed. We do anticipate that when we have a positive case, more students will likely have been in close contact with the individual and will need to quarantine. Should your student come in close contact with an individual who has been diagnosed with COVID-19, 
You can expect a phone call from our health office. Staff will inform you of the close contact, explain the IDPH and DCHD recommendations for quarantine and procedures for returning to school. Please keep in mind that these procedures are defined by the Illinois Department of Public Health and all school districts are required to follow them. Dr. Knowlton, Assistant Superintendent for Assessment and Accountability will now provide an assessment update. Uh, good evening, it's with pleasure I'm allowed to share with you the results of our mid-February through mid-March NWEA MAP growth assessment. Uh, I'm gonna qualify a lot of the things I say uh, by keeping in mind as we interpret some of the pieces of this that we administered this assessment to 84% of the student population across the district. Um, we invited remote students to come in um, and we also administered to hybrid students. We administered approximately as early as the fourth week after return to hybrid, just to give you a little context. I'm talking about the NWA MAP growth assessment. That's our um, state-of-the-art universal screening assessment that's typically given to 99% of the student population to give you a reference relative to 84%. We administer that, administer that assessing literacy and numeracy or what some people call reading and mathematics to students in grades K through eight. And we typically do that August, January, and May. So this year is a little bit different. We've only actually given this test three times. We gave it in the fall of 19, so somewhere around August, September of 2019. And then we gave it a second time in January of 20. That was our second administration. This February through March was our third administration. So we actually haven't gone through a full cycle. Um, the, uh, the purpose of this assessment really is to guide us with respect to where we are in terms of uh, meeting standards. This is a standards aligned assessment and um, it's highly useful with respect to predicting who's on target with respect to meeting standards on high stakes accountability measures. Um, I have to say that there's largely positive information in this. Um, I think a lot of people were pleasantly surprised to see how well we've done given the context. Um, we've also gotten that feedback in talking with the research arm of NWEA MAP. On the next slide, I um, summarize those are percentages. They're not percentiles, but those are percentages of groups of students that participated in assessment, um, in this assessment. So across the district, again, this is K-8, 79% of students that self-identify as Asian American participated. You can see African American was 68% and so on. Different levels of participation. When I say 84% participated, this is how this breaks down across race, ethnicity. On the next slide, we have a breakdown based on some other demographic variables. 71% of our special education population participated, 76 for economic disadvantage, and 80% of English learners. So we're not looking at a picture of all students. Keep that in mind as we take a look at this. I think people want to sometimes over extrapolate and, and, and think about this as though we're looking at all students. We're not, but we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. On the next slide, I did, this is a stacked bar graph that breaks our performance from January 20 in reading to January 21, not January 21, winter 21, which is really February, March, into quintiles. And if you're familiar with quintiles, it's basically breaking a distribution into five equal parts, roughly the zero to 20th, 20th to 40th, 40th to 60th, and so on. You can see, in this case, darker is better. In the winter of 2020, about 46% of our population in reading across K-8 fell into the 80th percentile rank nationally and higher. When I talk about percentiles, I'm not talking about COVID norms, I'm talking about norms relative to just ordinary, ordinary school, right? So the norms that we're comparing ourselves to are to how students do under ordinary circumstances, not in the midst of a pandemic. And you can see there's not much of a shift with respect to the percentages. Um, the lowest decile, sorry, the lowest quintile, 6%, in winter of 20 compared to 8% in winter of 2021. I think this is largely positive. These are percentages, they're not counts. So they do add a percent, in this case ends up being a little over 100 students. So when you see shifts in percentages, you're talking about movement of 100 students across nine grade levels, just to give it a little context. Um, just to summarize, this isn't, there's not a dramatic shift as evidenced by the data we collected so far. The next slide I think corresponds to mathematics. You'll see the same thing. Very, very similar. Um, not shockingly, high reading achievement is correlated strongly with high math achievement in this district and others. Students that tend to do well also tend to do well in the other. And you don't see a dramatic shift in the percentages as you break kids down into quintiles relative to pre-pandemic. Again, great news, very stable. Um, we didn't see a cataclysmic shift or a downfall. 
Um, you know, I, this is looking at group data. I know there's examples and situations where individual students are performing differently than expected, Not, no doubt, but you know, in this context, I'm talking about the health and well-being of the whole district. We didn't see a remarkable change in performance, and that's, you know, probably speaks to the efforts of staff, parents, community members, everybody that's been involved in supporting students over the last year. The next slide, um, this is a breakdown, and these numbers are median national percentile ranks. They're not percentages. Sometimes when we look at data, we look at the percentage of kids that meet standards. This is the median percentile rank. These numbers reflect what the average or typical student, what our 50th percentile is locally. Pretty, pretty astonishing by most people's standards. And I've kind of laid out winter 2020 compared to winter 21. And you'll see slight, slight variation. I caution people against over-interpreting slight changes in median percentile ranks. Realistically, probably not academically meaningful. Maybe statistically significant, but not from an educational perspective. We're still doing very, very well in the midst of what we've experienced for the last year, considering you know, what, everybody's, you know, what everybody's struggled with. So um, slight variation, you see a downward trend across grade levels, um, but on the whole, this is, very, this is I think, very strong performance given the conditions we're in. The next slide, I break this down by race ethnicity. Again, the median percentile, for example, with the Asian population, that means that half of the population in this district that tested falls above the national 87th and half fall below. That's how you interpret that. So no change at all in Asian performance, slight decline in African-American black, and you can interpret the rest a bit more with Hispanic Latinx and so on. Um, again, I think we're pleased. We're obviously not happy to see any declines at all, um, but this is just some of the things we're looking at in terms of monitoring who this change affected the most. The next slide, uh, again, a similar breakdown as the other presentations I've done, you see a seven percentile, that's not percentage, but a median seven percentile rank decline for special education, a dip for economic disadvantage, as well as English learner. These trends are not unexpected relative to a national, for information we're getting nationally, not just about this achievement measure, but other achievement measures. So the fact that you see declines among our, our more at risk population of students uh, whether it's race, ethnicity, or students with disabilities, economic disadvantage, that's not unusual at all. In fact, we have less of a decline. In fact, most people outside of this organization that look at these numbers are impressed by the fact that the typical student that qualifies for economic disadvantage um, is functioning pretty much near the average range nationally, um, even in the midst of pre- and post-pandemic. Just to give a little context, the next slide is uh, the mathematics by grade. Um, and you can see that's, that's not incorrect. Uh, kindergarten, actually, the median is remarkably high. Half the population of students that tested are at or above the national 91st. Soak that in. That is incredible. I mean, as some people might think it's a dream. Um, and to see that that's the level of performance that we're, we're exhibiting right now in the midst of this is tremendous. First grade, you can see some dips as we get into fifth grade, sixth, seventh, and eighth. As we looked at the data afterwards, we looked a little closer at who the 16% that didn't test were, right? Because we're always interested. We're not looking at everybody. We're looking at almost everybody. But is there anything about the 16%? For the students that we have data from the prior fall and winter, those students were high-achieving students. So they actually would have brought up our median percentile rank. I'm not saying they would have leveled it out, but there's probably a little bit of an exaggeration of difference from last winter to this winter based on the fact that we didn't have full participation among some of our higher-achieving students. Similar to the reading data, kind of walk through on the next slide. Um, by race, ethnicity, again, solid Asian performance, um, a three percentile rank decline, African American, five for Hispanic, Latinx, two or more races, very similar, and then white was three percentile rank decline. Imagine if you went to your pediatrician and your pediatrician said that your child's, I don't know, growth percentile in, in weight or height changed by three percentile rank points. I'm talking about an individual in this case, you probably wouldn't, it probably wouldn't be a reason for alarm. Do you know what I mean? And so this is again group data and what this doesn't reflect is individual student performance and how that can fluctuate. This is looking in aggregate at how everybody's done. Um, the next slide really reflects changes from last winter to this winter with respect to the median national percentile rank across special education, free and reduced lunch or economic disadvantage 
and um, our English learners actually improved. Again, that could be also a function of who participated as well. So we're very tentative about you know, saying this truly reflects our exact state of being at this point in time. But generally, it's very, very positive. The next slide, um, I've gone through and, and tried to highlight some of the successes. Our reading achievement, as we've seen in other measures like IAR and PARC before that, generally speaking, is typically higher than mathematics, and we see that in this situation as well. Um, reading achievement looks to be relatively stable across grade levels, um, with some slight exception in some areas, and I'll go through that, but relative to math, we see greater stability in reading. Fifth through eighth, eighth grade math, I talked a little bit about a slight downward trend. Um, reading and math achievement more significantly impacts some students rather than others, right? As we would expect, and as we've seen in other situations, um, you know, times of stress and difficulty and challenge impact certain kids depending on what opportunities and resource access they have, so that's no different in this case. And um, like I said before, our higher achieving students not being a part of the later grades as much likely impacted what you're seeing tonight. On the next slide, I'll just make a beep. Um, I summarized the K-8 reading, um, which is, like I said before, largely very positive. When you go beyond just the global areas of reading and mathematics, we take a look at some of the sub areas that are assessed by NWA MAP, and you can identify stability or instability across subscales. Um, kindergarten, very stable across those areas that I bulleted. I'm not gonna read those, but you can see the same thing for grades two through eight. We did not see a significant change. I mean, you really have to be, I mean, there's, there's no change in kindergarten and second through eight relative to the last year, which is actually incredible. It's wonderful. It's a great place to be. First grade was an exception, but don't take away from this hearing that every first grade in every school underperformed. You really have, this is, I'm talking about district trend, and you have to take a look school by school, and, and we're in the process of doing that. We have been doing that already, so don't overgeneralize and think everywhere first grade is taught. You know, there was a decline. In some cases, there was a gain as well. So this, these are global trends. Next slide summarizes uh, mathematics, K and one. Um, like I said before, higher in kindergarten, and then we saw stability in an area in first grade, and then lower areas uh, relative to last year. This is, again, only relative to last winter in those three subcategories or sub areas that MAP assesses. And they're very slight declines. They're not like, I don't want people to walk out and think, wow, the bottom fell out of operations, algebraic thinking, number and operations and geometry in first grade math. It's not, they went down, but they didn't go down cataclysmically. You know, it's, it's, it's degrees, and in this case, it's subtle, it's not, it's not dramatic at the district level. The next slide, I tried to summarize um, grades two through four, and I noted relatively stable performance. And then fifth grade, we saw stable, except for the area of geometry. Again, don't assume all schools under, you know, underperformed in geometry. That just as a district turned out to be an area of relative uh, weakness compared to the other areas, or lesser stability than the other areas. And then the last math slide, um, we saw Sixth grade, um, relatively lower in most areas. Again, maybe a function of who tested. Seventh grade stability in two areas and then uh, a decline relative to the previous year in, in the two areas that are on the slide. And then eighth grade, we saw all areas, uh, a lesser level of functioning than, and when I say, you know, go back to like looking at the percentile rank declines, we're not talking about an incredible change in performance. We're looking at slight deviations relative to having only done this one other winter at all, so we're, we're comparing it to our first year. Um, the next slide, again, just to remind you, 84% of students tested, you know, it's our goal to really get as many more students in. You can understand why that's important now by May, June, and we'll go ahead and again invite as many as possible students in. We provided transportation last time for people to come in so that they could test. Remote students are obviously encouraged and invited to come in, that's definitely optional. We'd have greater confidence the more students we assess. Um, we want to also take a look as we move forward and incorporate other pieces of information to what I just presented to you. We are obviously going to take a look at May, June. Uh, we'll start getting IAR data in uh, probably mid-summer, early summer, mid-summer, depending on the state timeline. And so um, the state of this data now in schools um, is that everyone has access to how they did and this has been taking, teams have been taking a look at this globally, maybe by grade level, by subject, and then ultimately by student to have an understanding of where students are, you know, given that this is really their first time back after, after um, being in hybrid for four weeks. 
Uh, one more slide, I think. We are on the, uh, a little information about the panorama survey. We didn't talk a lot about SEL so far, but that survey, and Dr. Leakes can address any questions if you have any about the content or nature of that, but that, the intention is to do that annually, mid-April through mid-May, uh, for an evaluation of student social emotional perception. That's a survey that goes down to fourth grade and up to 12th grade. We're obviously, like I talked about, doing the mid-May to mid-June map growth, as many students as possible, again, reading and math, K through eight. Um, the IAR, the, we can actually, we've begun administering the IAR now that we're back from spring break. Um, the five essentials is finished. We'll get results internally at the end of May. Take a look at that. Student perception data especially. We'll get results based on COVID questions and student perceptions around the impact of COVID on their academic functioning. And, um, you know, we're going to continue to fold all this information into understanding what we need as a district as well as, you know, where are their strengths and weaknesses with respect to things like school improvement plans and, and student level functioning at, at each school level. And I think, uh, I believe that wraps up my... Great. So as we, uh, students transition out of the pandemic and related school closures and lockdown, just like it has been critically important uh, throughout our return to learn uh, process, it is critically important that we continue to support the whole child. We are committed to our district mission in order to support students in meeting the mission. We must focus on social emotional learning alongside academic instruction. We are currently gathering additional data on how the pandemic has impacted each student. Teams will be analyzing the five essential survey to assess the emotional impact of remote learning in this spring. We will be surveying our students in their sense, on their sense of belonging, safety and inclusive practices using the panorama survey. Additionally, educators will be observing students both in person and online to gather informal data on their social emotional well-being. Our student services teams are prepared to support any student identified as needing additional care. As we have learners engaging in increased in-person learning and learners who are remaining remote, continuing to build positive relationships between educators and students and students to students will be critically important. The research tells us that some students have experienced trauma due to the pandemic. We have provided professional learning to all educators on the impact of this trauma and classroom practices that are trauma informed. We have implemented, implemented and will continue to implement our SEL curriculum this curriculum includes explicit instruction on building resiliency, coping strategies, and positive mindsets. As part of the curriculum, we will measure students' acquisition of social emotional skills to ensure they are progressing. We want to ground our response to the disruption of in-person instruction with our multi-tier system of support. We know that supporting students' academic and social emotional growth requires collaboration from educators, families, students, and the community. Meeting the needs of every learner requires the joining of collective expertise, skills and knowledge through the implementation of collaborative teams. Parents are viewed as essential partners and their expertise and knowledge of their child is critical in developing interventions, enhancements that accelerate learning. We've identified three formal collaborative teams, school improvement team, professional learning communities, and instructional support teams as the central structure for responding to the academic and social emotional needs of students. School improvement teams engage in ongoing systemic, systematic evaluation of the core curriculum and the school climate based on student data and stakeholder feedback for the purpose of adjusting current practices and structures to engage every student in rigorous curriculum and high quality instruction to ensure every student has access to the same learning opportunities. Professional learning communities engage in an ongoing process in which educators work collaboratively in recurring cycles of collective inquiry and action research to achieve better results for the students they serve. Teams work collaboratively to assess, analyze results, and create interventions and extensions to ensure the success of all students. And our instructional support teams engage in developing individualized learning plans for students who are in need of intensive interventions or extensions. This team supports content area teachers in developing, implementing, and monitoring intensive interventions and enhancements for students demonstrating an educational need regardless if they are receiving identified services. All three teams work together to analyze data, leverage resources, and make shifts in instruction based on student needs. District administration, schools, and staff will access various resources and supports to ensure the approach the, to the academic and social emotional needs of students are met so that they have a successful end of the school year. Buildings have recently received their respective winter map school data, 
and will be spending time in collaborative teams to analyze and break down their individual school data by standard to identify instructional needs at the building, grade, classroom, and student level. Based on the individual needs of each building, grade level classroom or student, uh, the school improvement teams, the PLCs, the instructional support teams will develop a plan for meeting the needs of their students. And the response may include school improvement team determining that the master schedule needs to be adjusted to allow for more instructional minutes in math. A PLC team deciding to reteach specific essential standards to all students by co-teaching with the reading or math specialist. A PLC team identifying groups of students for targeted intervention in math or literacy and leveraging the reading or math specialist to provide small group and individual interventions as needed. And instructional support team engaging in individual problem solving for student and specific students to develop personalized plans for each student. We'll continue to partner with the DuPage Children's Museum to provide enrichment opportunities and to partner with the Naperville Education Foundation to support students and schools with after school, summer, and social emotional supports. As we did last summer, buildings will have time this summer to meet and do a comprehensive review of the data and plan for how to best meet the needs of students in the 2021-2022 school year. We all know the pandemic has caused a disruption to in-person learning for all students and that the reduced in-person instruction time has impacted each student differently. Providing students with additional time to learn the grade course level content through summer school is an effective strategy to address the disruption students experience. We are recommending that the district fund the cost of one summer school course for all students. Families may choose any course that is offered in summer school either this summer or the summer of 2022. We realize that many families may be anxious to travel, to see family, or need a break this summer and may not wish to participate in this summer, but believe that their student would benefit from this experience. Within summer school, there will be bridge courses that will support students in developing and reinforcing the skills necessary to be successful within their grade level or course. We will continue to offer algebra essentials this summer for incoming freshmen, and we have added an additional bridge math course for ninth grade students enrolled in honors algebra or geometry. Additionally, enrichment courses will once again be offered for students, and at the high school level, we'll be offering advanced placement prep courses. We are planning for full in-person instruction this summer. However, we will also continue to live stream courses for students who are not able or ready to return to in-person instruction. We are also prepared to purchase summer content for all grade levels if we are unable to staff all of our summer courses. In addition to summer school, we will be expanding Jumpstart to all elementary and junior high schools. Jumpstart provides students the opportunity to become reacquainted with buildings, connect with staff, build relationships with peers and staff, and re-engage in the ap academic setting in order to seamlessly transition back to school. In addition to high quality tier one planning and instruction, we are committed to providing additional resources and supports that will benefit all students as a response to the disruption of instruction. We are recommending supports that allow students to continue to work within the grade level curriculum and provide them with the support they need to master the essential skills. For the 2021-2022 school year, we are recommending the following. Provide at least one math specialist at each building to support grade level and content area teachers with co-teaching, targeted instruction and differentiation necessary to meet the needs of all students. Provide additional LBS and EL teachers at targeted schools to increase supports for students through the use of co-teaching. Co-teaching allows students to remain in the core curriculum and receive the targeted instruction necessary. It also provides additional supports to all students in the classroom. We recommend to enter into a contract with a tutoring agency to provide tutoring services on site or virtual before or after school in literacy or mathematics to students identified by school teams. Develop learning boot camps of about eight sessions that are designed to strengthen core skills needed for mastery of the essential standards. Implement new resources to support math and literacy instruction. Expand our community school concept and provide additional social work support where necessary. As we have stated previously, Naperville 203 remains committed to in-person learning as the best learning environment for students. We are excited that increased in-person learning begins tomorrow for every student who selected that model. For the remainder of this school year, we will continue to offer high quality remote learning for families who have selected that option. Our teams are busy working on the plans to return to full in-person learning for next fall 
And as we shared during the last presentation, there will be a remote option for next fall for those students who are unable to return to in-person learning due to medical uh, contradiction. I can never say that word, restraints. With that, uh, the team will be happy to answer questions from the Board of Education.